Today's presenters, Stephen Berry and Jonathan Bloomfield. Jonathan has over 10 years of experience providing applied science support across several sports. He received his PhD in science and football from Hull University in 2005. He has previously worked with Ulster Rugby, Sports Institute of Northern Ireland, and the English Rugby National Team. A former field hockey player himself, Jonathan is now based in Belfast and currently operating as a as a performance consultant for support to perform. Jonathan provides First Beat sports to teams within Ireland and has been working with First Beat Technologies since 2009. First Beat teams include Ireland Cricket, the Dublin Senior Football Team, the Irish Football Association, and today's guest, Irish Field Hockey. Our second guest is Stephen Barry. Stephen has been, the, has been the head of strength and conditioning for the Ireland men's national team since 2006. He achieved his master's degree in exercise physiology from Trinity College Dublin in 2004 and is the owner of B Elite High Performance Coaching based in Dublin, which he established in 2011. Stephen is also a level three hockey coach and most recently coached the Dublin YMCA in the Leinster Premier League from 2011 to 2014. Gentlemen, it's great to have both of you here, and the time is now yours. Thanks very much, Ben. Okay, thanks very much, Ben. Um, thank, thank you to all of you who have... Um, joined us this afternoon, given up your time, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll try and make this a, a very interesting half an hour for, for everyone. Um, talking about uh, you know, a sport that's very close to my heart and, um, and something that I've, I've enjoyed working, uh, being involved in, in recent months once again. So if, uh, if I crack on, just for those of you who aren't maybe familiar with the sport or are joining us um, from, from a different sport, um, Field hockey is a, is a game 11 versus 11. We've got playing squads of 18, and and we can roll players on and off the pitch an unlimited number of times. The format of the game is played in two slots of two halves of 35 minutes, or more recently, um, four quarters of 17 and a half minutes, and there's um, a 10 minute half time break. So some of the main rules of the of the game involve. Um, Ball can only touch one, one side of the stick, um, including the front edge of the stick as well. And uh, the ball is not allowed to touch the body, so if it hits something like your feet, it's a, it's a foul. Um, the players must score from inside a, a circle. Um, I have a slide coming up looking at the, the pitch, which will give you an illustration of what that looks like. And, um, and then most recently, most notably, the, a, a new rule has been introduced to the sport in 2009, and that is where, after a foul or a, or a restart for the game, whether it's off the a ball is off the end line or off the sideline, players can pa essentially pass the ball to themselves and um, and not be challenged for at least five meters. There's two umpires on the pitch. There's a video referee um, on the in international tournaments, and um, and there's a range of green, yellow, and red cards which. Um, mean that there's a sin bin times for players depending on what files they commit on the pitch at the time. So um, just at this moment I'm hoping if it's possible we, we run a, a short poll to see who's out there. Um, so we've got 60% of people 60 of people here are uh, involving hockey, 40% um, not, so I think it's quite important that I go through the game in case people aren't familiar with it. Okay, so I'll just end that poll. As promised, I will um, I'll just have one quick look at the pitch size. So this is our pitch. Um, so this is this area I mentioned earlier on is is what we call the circle. If I get my green arrow to work. The the black line here at the at the left and the right side of the pitch near the goals there there are the this the circle entry points where uh, you must be able must be inside this, this zone to to score okay the pitch is just over 90 meters long or 100 yards if you're joining us from the states and then 60 yards wide or, or 55 meters in, in width so it's not as big as a football pitch but 
I can I can certainly say that that in t every blade of grass or every blade of artificial grass is is used during a game. Um, the full full pitch is is utilised. Okay, so this is a slide I want to want to spend a bit of time on. We want to review the physiological demands of of the sport, and I'm going to focus mainly on the men's international uh, men's international game, as as we know it. And as I mentioned previously, in 2009, that rule change of auto pass, from my um, from my perspective, had a significant change in the demands, fitness demands, or on the game. The pace of the game has increased significantly, and unfortunately, you can probably see that that most of a peer-reviewed, most published knowledge on the game before that this um, this rule change, um, you can you can consider it pretty much outdated now, unfortunately. So it's it's a relatively young sport, I would argue now, because we we don't know too much about it. Um, saying that, um, a lot of teams are embracing technology in in the game, like other sports are, and um, some reported uh, statistics from GPS recordings have um, shown us that midfielders, strikers seem to reach distances in excess of nine kilometers um, in a 70-minute match. And then defenders usually cover six to seven, and even goalkeepers covering two kilometres, which is um, quite a quite a distance just based inside their zone. However, um, there's a few question marks over some of the, these numbers. Um, I think the FIH that govern hockey have, have um, posted this value of nine kilometres, but it's maybe not necessarily a true value because, as I mentioned, the the, the game involves a lot of rolling substitutions. And not every player will play 70 minutes, and and I believe that the nine kilometres that that's being is, is a projected nine kilometres if a player was to stay on the pitch. So the true value I think is somewhere between five and six kilometres in the men's game, and it's a very similar value in the in the ladies game at international level as well. There's not too much dif uh, too too much too many differences between those two sports, and and I'll also from anecdotal evidence that I've been able to attain. The differences between positions, defenders, midfielders, and strikers, are actually quite minimal. So it's so it's a blanket coverage of somewhere between five, six kilometres across 40 or 50 minutes worth of action. Now the FIH also published on their on their website during the World Cup that that 50% of this nine kilometres is, is covered at high speed. Unfortunately, they don't go into into detail on what they define as being a high speed. However, again, anecdotal evidence I've I've, I've uncovered um, from another international team, um, one of the top level teams, suggests that um, coverages of speeds above five meters per second or equivalent of 18 kilometers an hour seems to be around about 10 to 15 percent of the total distance that that the players will cover. So that to me suggests that yes, the game is fast-paced game. It involves a lot of um, high-speed work, but actually, due to potentially due to the pitch size, the guys don't attain the same level of speeds as say soccer and rugby would, or AFL or or a rugby league perhaps, because they don't really get to open up. There isn't a lot of space, but the game is uh, is certainly much about accelerating and decelerating very very frequently. So perhaps top end speeds and, and, and speeds beyond. 18 or 20 kilometers an hour aren't that frequent. They only they only account 10 percent. But certainly the, there's a need to be to be that quick. But it's the ability to sustain um, uh, sort of a high to moderate to high speeds on a on a consistent basis. There's also an issue there. I've I've mentioned that there's a there's a discrepancy between time on field versus the total time. And um, I've I've got. The, the, probably the most recent paper in, the, in um, peer-reviewed journals um, has has looked at this factor indeed, and it's been reported in the International Journal of Sports Physiology and Performance, 2013. This is a paper written by Andy White and Neil McFarlane. They conclude that time on pitch and and full game analysis procedures are comparable for distance-related variables, but they're significantly different for time-dependent factors. So actually, use Using inappropriate analysis procedures can alter the perceived demand of, of field hockey based on the fact that there's rolling substitutions. 
and and this inaccuracy in in terms of the perception of physiological demand could actually negatively influence the training prescription. So we've got to be careful. Is is what what I'm what I'm um, I'm pointing out whenever we're looking at distance and speed as being our markers of of, uh, of physiological load. And but but if we if we boil it down to to, to meters per minute, we're looking at a, a rough average of about 130 per meters per minute for men and 120 for women. Which when again when you cross that when you compare that across sports, that's quite that's quite high. That's that's a, dem, a very high demand. Thrown into the mix, the tournament. If you look at like the Olympic tournaments or the World Cup tournaments, they're playing high frequency, high volume of games in a very short period uh, period of time. And the games are often played in hot and humid conditions. So countries like India, Malaysia, the U.S., across Central Europe in 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 the summer months, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Argentina, they're pop, they're powerhouses of of international hockey, and and unfortunately they come with hot and humid heat and humidity, and that also throws into another phys demanding physiological challenge. So if you look at a tournament in total in uh, you know, if we if we imagine that that games are six kilometers in length, uh, if we multiply that by seven, we you know we have 42 kilometers in total distance, and we've got this 21 kilometers at what we, what we don't know as but but is reported as high speeds. Um, so arguably, um, and the part of this presentation is going to focus on is is the aerobic capacity of these athletes has to be high. There's a severe demand when we're on the field, and um, perhaps VO2 max is is something of significant importance and we're going to postulate here that maybe a value of above 62 for men is is uh, a value worth with uh, that's desirable okay so what we're going to walk you through now is is a little bit of a journey of of how we've introduced first beat into Irish hockey and um and later you'll hear from Stephen and he'll tell you exactly his experiences um that that he's had with with the system at these three major tournaments in the last 12 months. Just to give you a bit of context, Ireland are, are ranked 15th in the world currently, and um, and the current squad, less than 30% of this current squad are, are full-time and professional. So um, there's there's a, a demand. These these guys who um, who are in the squad but have other jobs to do, um, they've they've got uh, difficulties to try and reach the levels of fitness as some of the other countries who are in full-time programs. Here's a shot of us just before Ireland, Ireland uh, line out against England in Hamburg, and um, and here's just a quick snapshot of of the system on the bench, and um, we'll be we'll be talking through how um, what information we gain from the system and how we use it, and Stephen will particularly go through that. So the first beat sports system, um, I think it's a, a really perfect system to be used in field hockey um, because it's one system doing a multi multiple things. Um, it's it's it has a capacity to monitor training both both in real time and and remotely. Um, and they've got a through the partnership first beat I've, I've got with Garmin and uh, Sunto. Also, it can be used for checking how well recovered players are. So how are they coping with the the demands of a tournament? Um, how are their bodies responding from from a, a really tough game? That how are they presenting themselves the next morning? And we can also look at 24-hour stress and recovery monitoring using a first beat bodyguard monitor. And and finally, um, and very valuably, the the system can also provide us with a, with quite accurate fitness testing and uh, highly accurate VO2 max fitness testing. So uh, again, we'll be highlighting later in the presentation examples of of how this how we've used this. So, um, what makes it special? Um, first beat's pretty special because it's not a heart rate monitoring system per se. It's it's deeper than that. It goes beyond it. It it looks at the heart rate variability. So it's the um, the time interval between every single heartbeat that uh, that is recorded uh, at a very high frequency. So we're looking at um, at variation of heartbeats. And and we can tell a lot from the body based on the what we call the heart rate variability. Now, based on the heart rate variability, uh, it's it's possible to mathematically model the oxygen consumption rate um, from from um, from the information from that da from that data, and um, and this provides us in first beat with a value we call epoch, um, so it's the excess post oxygen consumption. And 
essentially this this is a mimic or it says a field based measurement of of breath by breath gas analysis essentially and um it's it's um described as the general disturbance of homeostasis brought on by exercise so it just shows how far removed the body is from a restful state into an exercise state and um it's very highly correlated with um gas analyzed epoch and also with blood lactate markers as well or blood la blood lactate measurements if you want to find out more about this, you can look at um, the First Beat webinar on training load that was held on, on March the 20th. It goes into a little bit more detail. And as well, there's the physiology section of uh, firstbeat.com, which provides all the white papers and all the correla correlation values um, behind, these, uh, behind EPOC. OK, but what's, essential, what's, what's really good to, to know is EPOC is, is a dynamic measurement. So um, it's a little bit like um, getting out of breath and, get, and, and then getting a chance to get your breath back. So you can see the red line along this chart. You can see where the exercise is, 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 uh, is intense. And you, you see the epoch, the red line, tends to rise. And, um, and then when, they, when there's a break in the exercise, the epoch and the, uh, the recovery rate starts to fall. And um, this is just a, just a really clear way of, of showing how severe the exercise is and how well the person recovers. Now, to make it, necess uh, to make it really simple, though, for the, for the athletes, for the coaches, um, first bit of scale this epoch value down in, and into a, a very meaningful and understandable number called training effect. And that's a scale of 1.0 to 5.0. And you can see the thresholds, the bands that, that go alongside that. So, if I have a training effect of 2.5, that's, that's enough physiological load on the cardiovascular system for me to, just to maintain the level of fitness. Or if, um, or, you know, if I push it on to, say, 4, I've, I've really stressed my cardiovascular system and, and hopefully improved my VO2 max. A further um, loading variable in, in first speed sports is, is the TRIMP model, um, which stands obviously for training impulse, which has been around for a long time and, and is used widely in dynamic intermittent sports, field-based sports like soccer and so on. It's quite popular for for this measurement. And uh, first bit, I've, I've picked up the same formula. However, I've, the the original f equation was based off mean heart rates, uh, and in first beat sport, the trim scores are much more accurate because it's based on every single heartbeat, um, and there's there's uh, no error because of the, we avoid the averaging. So this is very, like I say, it's very useful for intermittent sports. Also, essentially, the, the two, the, these two variables will, will, you know, the training effect, we can report, reports essentially the, the intensity and the aerobic impact of the session. And the trimp is used to calculate the volume, the load of the session through volume and intensity. OK. So the great thing about first beat is we can get this live. We we're able to to follow. We kit players out with heart rate belts. Heart rate belts send a signal back to the um, laptop, and we're able to channel um, values such as epoch, percent VO2, percent heart rate max, trim, training effect. We get this all in real time on the uh, on the on the uh, laptop as the players are performing. So valuable, rich source of information. We've got color coding. We've got ways of filtering groups. We can put defenders, forwards, midfielders. We can group them off, and we can quickly find them um, and, and have an understanding of what load they're experiencing at any moment in time. OK, so at this moment, I'm going to hand across to Stephen, and he's going to talk a little bit about his experience with First Beat and, um, and, and how, how he's found it settling into the Irish team. Hi there, folks. As you can see from the picture there, that's uh, me at the Malaysia tournament recently. Even though it's coming close to sundown at 7 o'clock, it was 37 degrees and 90-odd percent humidity. Uh, so when we talk about working in undesirable environments, it's certainly one of the top of the list. Um, 
as the strength and conditioning coach in international hockey, you're not allowed to sit on the bench with the team. Um, must sit in the stand. So I have the laptop on my knee. I have the receiver there beside me on the tripod, and the players down on the field uh, warming up in that photo for the game. And then I'm I hook hooked up through a microphone to the manager of the team on the bench, and between the two of us, we communicate together based on um, on analyze, w watching how the f how the heart rates and the epoch level of the players are working at the particular point in time, uh, and then assisting them with regards to substitution and substitu uh, the way the substitutions go on the field real time. Um, in this slide, we can see here what happens because it is a roll on, roll off game uh, with players coming on and off the field all the time. Uh, teams will set out a formal pathway, if you like, the way they come, the substitutions happen. Uh, in that, player one, two, and three start the game. Um, after five or six minutes, the first substitutions happen, and we have. Uh, a striker will come on, a midfielder will come on, a wing defender will come on, a central defender will come on. Two minutes later, another player comes on for a different player, and so on through the through the game. And it's very structured uh, in that way. And uh, that leads to 30, 40 substitutions potentially per half of the game. With players, as you see there, midfielders may be playing six minutes on, four minutes off. Uh, defenders usually just a little bit longer. Um, on the field than than the other players, but it's very structured. It's very it's very regimented. It also conflicts with the with the coaching role sometimes, if you like, because you're kind of wanting to have strong players on at different difficult times on the pitch uh, when you might be down a goal, up a goal, with specialists on the bench who uh, who may take short corners and set pieces, you need them on the pitch at certain periods of time and the coach will want them involved. Uh, so uh, even though this is very regimented, we need we need to be able to be dynamic in, in making a change as the game happens live. Um, so that's really where I come into play. With all the planning you can do with, with something like that and having player one on to start the game who might be a potential drag flicker uh, and then having player one on again for the last five or six minutes of the game. Uh, it's really important that you you manage that. But then what happens if somebody gets carded, somebody gets injured, um, and they have to come off the field? It messes up the, the system. And then I can help out there. So the manager will ask me, who, who needs off next? Uh, and from the live information, from the live data, I can look and say, right, well, player seven is has been on for a long period of time. His epoch is built up. Um, he's spent a lot of time in high-level heart rates. Uh, potentially, he needs to rest. And then there's the difference in people's work rate, the people's fitness levels uh, during the game. And you would expect then that people who are fitter to stay on longer. And that's where uh, we can we can use this system also in that the epoch buildup is specific to the person. And then rather than moving forward from this setup, moving forward, hockey can potentially look at live use of roll-on, roll-off substitutions and, and call people off when they need to come off, um, as well as uh, linking in with the coach. So if we look at the next one, for example, th this gives us an idea of the work rate of the players during the game. And uh, here we have a midfielder playing against Germany, the top slide and we have the top graph, and we have a midfielder against Holland in the second graph. Um, and we can see really that uh, the there's a lot of time spent in blue and red. Okay, blue and red is red is above 95% of the person's uh, maximum heart rate. Blue is above 90% uh, of their maximum heart rate. So you can see when they're on the field here, they're spending an awful lot of time above 90% of their maximum heart rate. And you can see the red line, the epoch line that Johnny's already talked about climbing through that first stint on the field, then they get substituted, the epoch begins to drop, and then climbs again toward the end of the half. The yellow dot at the end uh, signifying their peak epoch for that half, and also giving the training effect, which you can see then at the top of the screen in the data listed, uh, where the training effect there is 3.5. So it, it gives you an idea 
in the second game you can see against Holland okay they're on for a different period of time again a lot a lot of blue some red not so high but you can see the gradual epoch uh, climbing the whole way through then a smaller recovery time and uh, then the epoch climbing again towards the end of the half you know you just see the difference in workload for the game the player stayed on longer epoch climb even though the epoch is 3.6 for this game uh, you're still getting a situation whereby the player has hit the similar level but spent quite different amounts of time on the field what we'll do is we'll move to the next slide which shows the similar information um, for a def uh, defender sorry um, and uh, we we have the similar information and, and no matter what your position is when you're on the field these are uh, two different players in two different games that you have uh, just an awful lot of blue and awful lot of red you see in the second at the bottom graph a player spending an awful lot of time in red zone you know you've got four or five minutes where this guy is just busting a gut uh, running around very hard and uh, a sort of time where I'll get on the radio and say that this guy needs a breather um, because his, his epoch just keeps climbing. What we noticed, and this is something interesting, and I'll, I'll flick between these two slides quickly here, uh, and you'll see straight away just the visual impact of that slide, the difference in this first slide uh, between the top worker in the half having a training effect of 4.8 when you take into account it goes to five for a 35 minute window this guy has really spent a lot of time working hard but you've also got the the players work the least at 2.9 the spread is pretty big okay and this is when we only initiated using uh, first beat with the with the team and if you take into account a player plays seven games in ten days if this player one let's call him player one at the very top there has spent plays every game like this one you can't expect his performance to be very good for the last couple of games. So what we'd prefer to see uh, managing with first beat properly is that there's a, a more even spread of workload per half. Um, in that way, you're going to guarantee that you're going to get the best out of these players for a full tournament and really manage uh, what they're doing. The next slide shows information. Now, if this isn't necessarily one player one game it's kind of like the peak values we're getting from players in different positions so the the epoch peak there at the top could be from player one and the training effect below it could be from player two but it just gives you an idea of the sort of information that we're getting from each player and from different positions and i think what's really important to notice at the bottom there is just the amount of time they're spending in 95% and above and out of a half uh, the defender there is spending 20 minutes that's 57% of the time in super high uh, workload and that's 61% of the time of him being on the field because he may have come off for three or four minutes so it's just really important and again the VO2 max represented there uh, the midfielders the guys getting from one goal circle to the other goal circle uh, at uh, with with um, VO2 there of 62 and we're suggesting that that's kind of the base level that's required at, at uh, international hockey at this time. So again just for me and one thing that links in so well is what we may have done in the past for recovery um, the guys wake up in the morning we go through a recovery process of weighing in um, and a, um, a subjective questionnaire on well-being but we also in the past would have used a sub-maximal aerobic assessment uh, where we go outside and do a run and monitor that um, and when the guys heard that all they needed to do was bring their pillow out into the corridor have a lie down strap the heart rate monitor on and, and snooze for five minutes uh, it was a very welcomed uh, protocol to use so the guys were super happy about that and what we're seeing is that it's, it's amazing how well the when the guys answer responsibly for the subjective questionnaire how much the first speed is analyzing is, is, is running in line with, with, with that and Johnny will show us a little bit later. So when we run that test we get this screen uh, on each of the players so here there's only five or six shown but 
when we do it across the team, obviously all 18, 20 players are right there on the screen. You can see who's at 100%, who's at 50%, who's at really struggling. And, you know, it makes it really simple. Just there where all the lads are lying on the ground for five minutes, we get an instant feedback report on where they're at. Over breakfast, I can sit down with the coach, sit down with the physio, and uh, even meet the player if required. Um, to manage their setup and manage their the, where they are at that day at that time, um, and Johnny's actually going to go through a little bit more about that in, in the next few slides, and uh, I'll be able to take questions about any of that stuff at the end. So right now I'm going to pass back to Johnny, and he'll take us through to the end. Thanks very much, Steve. Just conscious uh, where we're at in terms of time at the minute, um, so I'm going to try and quickly wrap up the rest of the presentation as quick as I can here. So just a quick note on heart rate variability. I wanted to make um, make it known, and particularly on this side of recovery, I mean, HRV has um, been lo long been used as a, a marker of um, physiological stress, and it, it can be a valuable window into, into an athlete. And I mean, the origins of first beat technology came through uh, research done in terms of athlete overtraining. So, um, again, there's there's plenty of evidence or plenty of reports on firstbeat.com to go to 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 read up about HRV. Just in a real simple terms, though, they, this is what we're seeing: a good recovered athlete and a bad recovered athlete. So, although their resting heart rates are very similar, 48 beats per minute and 47 beat, beats per minute here. The the HRV is very very different. So this is top banner top um, graph is someone with high high HRV and and in a, in a good healthy state and and the bottom chart shows a person with very low HRV and and um, and someone who's who's suffering from a lot of stress and and having difficulties and problems. So perhaps this is one one of one of the answers behind the under unexplained underperformance syndrome that we always wonder about. Okay, we and, and with first beat we can go even further. We, we instead of just necessarily a five-minute check uh, for people who have got a low recovery score, we can take them out to deeper monitoring, and we attach this bodyguard I mentioned at the start, and and we can check uh, every heartbeat for well, for for six full days if if you want um, on on one battery charge. So we can get a really full profile of of what's happening, not only in the athlete's training life, but everything that else is going on, and and, and assessing their Sleep quality, and how much other stress is occurring in, in whatever they're doing. Okay, this is a this is a, a nice wrap up slide showing the the desktop on the um, on the First Beat Sports software. So this is the uh, the actual tournament results for for Ireland on these on the Champions Challenge um, back in April. So the you can see on the um, if I get the points are back. Oh, okay. the, the 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 game highlighted here is, is is the first game of the tournament, and you can see the game, they had a game the following day, then a day off, then another game, and and so on and so on. Um, the the line represents the recovery the guys had. So if you look at every bar, you'll see that the line drops the following day. So the the demand of the game had a had a had a negative response on how well they recovered. Uh, the, on a on a positive note, whatever, whatever the Irish men were doing, the recovery strategies worked. They worked really well because you can see the rebound on the on the days off, that the recovery as a team average was improving every single time um, they were they had that rest. So overall, they they managed their their recovery through the tournament and it was fairly stable. So this was excellent, very good management by the Irish men. All right, so I talked uh, briefly about. Fitness testing. So here we are. Um, just last weekend, we we were able to test 40 players. Um, all the guys in blue shorts are the, the Irish senior men. All the guys in white are the Irish under 21s. And uh, we were able to put them through a maximal aerobic test. And uh, we were able to do that on the pitch, all in one go. And within 10 minutes, we had uh, our VO2 max assessments for every single player ready to uh, ready to be printed and sent out. So it was. Um, it saved an awful lot of time, an awful lot of money, um, if for for getting a high level of information, which was incredibly valuable. The system itself has inbuilt protocols for VO2 max assessments, uh, such as YoYo, intermittent recovery one, recovery two, 
beep test and there's even space to create your own maximal and submaximal tests as well. It's a very simple one page report which provides level of a high level of information on training go it to move forward and to make progress. I uh, mentioned also at the start that, Gar that Garmin and Sunto are also partnered with FirstBeat. There's some FirstBeat technology living inside the devices that are shown on screen here. So these are very useful for collecting GPS information, but also mostly for, for remote monitoring of heart rate. We can use these for recovery checks. We can use these for uh, training when the boys train at clubs. And um, wherever the, in the world we can share this data back across the central uh, FirstBeat Sports license. And we can actually see, this is a, an, an image captured from the recent World Cup, there's actually, uh, these models of Garmin are actually starting to appear on, on uh, some of the players themselves, simply because they want real-time GPS in a fairly affordable format. Alright, so finally, just wrapping up, this is um, the experience, uh, the comment made by uh, Craig Fulton, who, who's uh, on the webinar, I, I can see, and he, he's uh, made a lovely comment saying, um, it's great for, for Irish hockey to be the, the pioneers of first beat and um, we regard it as a complete solution to meet the squad's monitoring needs. It's a, an ideal platform to be used in field hockey. And finally, my final slide, a comment from, from one of the players. So this is the Irish men's captain. So Ireland's players have all responded really well to first beat. Belts are comfortable, they're easy to wear, and the information is available on the bench. Everyone understands the data, and it's superb that we can also assess how well our bodies are recovering during tournaments. Okay, at this moment, that's the, that concludes our presentation. We're very happy to take any questions that have come through. Okay. Yes, thank you to both Stephen and Jonathan for the excellent presentation. I really get the impression we may have just you know, kind of barely scratched the surface as far as what we can actually do with first beat sports and field hockey. So we may, uh, may be grounds for another webinar if you guys are up for it. Oh yeah, absolutely. We've enjoyed this. I'm so, we, we apologize for slightly going over our time, but <laughs> we've probably limited ourselves. We could talk for another 40 minutes if we wanted, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. Okay, question lies. Uh, let's get right to it. We had a lot of good questions. And again, just a reminder, if we don't get to your question, uh, we are going to answer it via email within the next 24, 48 hours. So hang tight. We'll get to you. First question is, um, and actually this is probably the most common one that we get, is do I need to be an expert in physiology to understand first beat? Or a lot of coaches ask, do I need to have a strength and conditioning coach to run this system for my program? Uh, okay, but I'll tell you what. I'll, as I'm still on the on the mic, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that one. So um, this is, I would say no. <laughs> I think I think first beat is a perfect tool for just about anyone to pick up and and run. I think as long as it's set up right and and you you're well trained and you've you're you're got a good install, good person to install it for you, then the system will run very smoothly, very flawlessly. And and you'll have no trouble dealing with that. And I've and I've trained um, coaches who coaches up to do it as they and they go off and deliver their session. And the the system can leave it on the side, trust it to do its job. It's going to work fine. The great thing about the system is the, the high level of information that lies underneath first beat, but this very simple level of information that's presented at the top end. So players all understand what training effect is. Some players even understand what Trimp is, and they all figure out if they've recovered or not. They can understand that percentage number that comes out from a quick recovery test. So I'd say no. No need for any specialist or ex expert user or dedicated operator. I think anybody can pick this up and run with it. Okay, thank you. And next question. Let's see if we can get it up here. How does this relate to performance? Were the players technically, tactically effective despite the high heart rate values? Okay, I'm going to pass that one over to Stephen. Hi there. I mean, the one of the one of the interesting things is that the you know we're 
if you look at where Ireland finished in the recent competition, for example, um, we are ranked fifth in the tournament in Malaysia, that Champions Challenge, and uh, we finished fourth. So if you're looking at did we perform, the team definitely performed and performed above its ranking. Uh, if you like, we boxed above our weight in that tournament. And uh, it, it's, it's a necessity of the sport because it is a predominantly amateur sport across the world. You're supposed to play these games repetitively one day after the other. It's vital that you're able to perform again and again, even with these high heart rates. And it also simulates the the way you the way you train. Um, we had a young squad with us in Malaysia, and you know, using first beat to get our recovery done properly, as Johnny showed, and the way we could bounce back because we knew how much a game hurt us, um, and based on the demand we had to put in and the workload that we had to put in then we have to match that with, with our recovery strategies to get ourselves back up. And even though we had a young squad, a reasonably low amount of caps compared to what we could we may have done in the past or previous tournaments, you know, we still responded technically and tactically on the field uh, with good performances. Thank you, Stephen. It looks like, again, I apologize everybody, there were a lot of questions that came in. I think we're only going to have time for one more. Remember, we will reply to every question via email. So our final question, let's see if we can get it up. Okay, so Epoch is a cumulative score, but do you look at the instantaneous values? For example, do you look at how quickly Epoch is accumulating rather than just the total at that point? Real good question. How I how I manage it at the how I manage it on the sideline is um, I monitor what the player's epoch is when they come back on the field or when they start on the field, um, and then look at how that's gra how that's building at the point in time. So uh, you may have two players on the field who have a similar peak epoch um, or a similar current epoch level. Um, but you may have had someone who's been on for six or seven minutes already and who's built up uh, an epoch in a period of time. And then essentially it's, uh, I'm, I'm looking for those players rather than somebody who's only just built up a small epoch for that small bout of exercise. So um, it, it's just a bit of management. I have a spreadsheet that I use on my, on my lap when I'm, when I'm watching the players and I just know what it is, what their epoch is when they come on the field. And then I'm looking for the one who's built up the most over the shortest possible time um, and, and looking at potentially getting, getting them off the field if necessary. If not, then I look for the next available player. Uh, just Johnny's going to add to that just one second. That is a cracking question, actually. Um, so what we want to know is, is we, well, we, we kind of set ourselves epoch thresholds for players. Once they reached a particular threshold, that would trigger us to, to try and get them off the pitch so that they could recover and, um, and, and fresh legs. Uh, what was brilliant is when, when they came off the, the pitch, we were able to say, okay, their next threshold, when, when, they, when their epoch starts to fall and reduce, is when they can go back on. And the feedback we were able to relay back to the players was, the fitter you you are, the 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 longer, the more minutes you'll you'll spend on the pitch based on the fact that you can cope with the epoch rise, and the faster, the less time you'll spend on the bench because of um, of your of your because your epoch fall will be much quicker. So um, and then we we track we track epoch peak for um, making sure that they uh, they don't over overstretch themselves. Hopefully that's that's a reasonable answer to that question that came up. Thank you. We're going to squeeze in one more question. I lied, we do have time for one more. Um, let's get it up here real quick. Okay, how long does the equipment last before I need to update it? Another good one. Um, I, I guess I've, I've been working with First Beat since 2009. I've still got the same equipment I had in 2009. Um, I've, I find it unbelievably reliable. It's robust and... Um, and and some, it's a very low management system in terms of uh, looking after the equipment. I don't have to worry about recharging things. You know, once the session's finished, I can put the equipment back in the bag and wait until the next next session. I, it doesn't need much management. 
again, it comes back to my point earlier on about how it, um, you don't need a dedicated operator or specialist to run it for you. It's very low, low maintenance and and highly robust. And I would say that the equipment that I have is still going, so it could, I don't know how long it, it'll last, but it's certainly lasting a long while. Thank you for that. Again, appreciate all the questions. We will get back to you as soon as possible with those. And unfortunately, we are out of time for this session. Again, just a reminder that uh, this First Beat webinar series will continue in the fall. And if you'd like to suggest a topic or a sport for the next webinars, you can visit our First Beat Sports webinar website and let us know what you'd like to see. That would be the same link that you signed up for the webinar from. Uh, also, this webinar recording will be available as a podcast on our website by Friday, June 27th. And again, I'd just like to give a special thanks to Jonathan Bloomfield and Support to Perform, as well as Stephen Barry and Irish Field Hockey. And uh, also thank you to all our participants, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar series in the fall.